Hello, this is David Hillier here and I'm coming to the end of my series on the question, are markets efficient or are they irrational? And in this video, I'm going to be comparing the market efficiency side with the irrational or behavioral finance side and asking the question, well, okay, which one seems to be most appropriate? What is the conclusion? Okay, so if you recall, we said that efficient markets, that uh, prices reflect information and they reflect that information in an unbiased way. Now, whether that is just reflecting past prices or reflecting all publicly available information or reflecting all information, we say that the prices take that information and based on that information, an appropriate price level is uh, arrived at. On the other hand, behavioural finance would argue that there are irrational pockets of investors that drive prices for a short period or for a longer period to be irrational. And the size of the group of irrational investors is such that the market cannot take advantage of the mispricing. And so these really come against each other and uh, they are in effect in conflict. So what is the, the outcome then? Well, we, we, let's look at the, the two behavioural biases that we discussed in an earlier uh, video. And we'll start off with representativeness. Now, what does that mean? If you recall, it means that investors take what has just happened to them most recently uh, or they may look at a sample, but it's a very small sample. And so you can't really draw out uh, any true uh, statistical uh, implications from a small sample, whether that's something you've collected or whether it's just a period that's just occurred to you just uh, recently. You can't really draw that information out and then come up with a, a very strong prediction. Well, representativeness says that, well, investors do actually do that. They overweight the importance of small samples. They overweight the experience that they've just had, say, in the last week or the last month. And as a result, they tend to overreact to things. They overreact to stock price changes. And we see that happens uh, with internet or tech stocks. They t tend to be more volatile. But then you have conservatism, and conservatism is the opposite of representativeness, which it says that, well, investors actually take too long to react to new information, that new information might come in, but it takes a long period for that the information to be fully impounded into prices. And when you have that, you've got underreaction in stock returns. And there is a very large body of research that shows the evidence of representativeness and at the same time there's a, a very large body of research which shows evidence of conservatism and in practice you see conservatism in banking stocks uh, so there's even within different industries you're you're getting contradictory results so that isn't really helpful but what i'll tell you is that you know, there is a lot of research out there finding lots of different things. So there's no, we haven't decided on an answer yet. And so let's collect all of that evidence together and then say, right, okay, what can we say? Well, the efficient markets group would argue that if you take all the behavioral finance research, uh, you, there is many papers that show evidence of underreaction as they show evidence of overreaction. Now, the efficient markets uh, supporters would say, theory should say that one would dominate in the limit, one would dominate in large samples, but we're not getting that. And in actual fact, uh, research by uh, Fama uh, argued that because there is many overreactions and underreactions uh, in the market in terms of research, what you're effectively saying is that these cancel each other out which goes back to one of the criteria or foundations of market efficiency, that there is no systematic bias. And so therefore, given that that's the case, then it means that the markets must be efficient. However, behavioural finance argue that, 
Well, wait a minute. Uh, if you recall that there are three criteria for efficient markets, and I covered that in a previous video, all three of those criteria are violated in practice. And we only need one of those to be violated for... Uh, oh, no, sorry. We need... Efficient markets say that we need only one to be efficient. Behavioural finance argues that all three are violated, so therefore the markets can't be efficient. And they even go further by saying that, look, okay, we recognise that there are lots of underreaction findings and there's lots of overreaction findings, but there are just too many out there for it to be mere chance. In fact, the, the sheer body of anomalies suggests that uh, the markets are inefficient. And when I talk to business people, uh, they say to me, no, the markets are definitely not efficient. Uh, I can give you examples of that. But you, know, you might believe that, and these are very successful business people, but alternatively, you might say, well, are you exhibiting signs of representativeness? That is, that you're only taking a very small sample of events, those events that happen to you, and you're then saying, well, okay, that's evidence of uh, irrational markets. So I'm afraid I can't give you an answer. What I want you to do, though, is just to go away and think, well, okay, recognise that this is still a debate that's very live, is very current, and uh, is still being argued over today. So thank you for listening. I hope that's been a, a very brief but enjoyable uh, review of uh, behavioural finance and efficient markets and in my next video, my last video in this series, I'll be looking at what you as a corporate manager can do to take advantage of uh, whether the markets are efficient or irrational. Thank you very much.